Good evening. Yeah, you're welcome to the Nigerian Pride, and I am your host, Lion Olu Shokumbi. Starting on a cool note today, but I will use the words of Peter Said Dakuku, one of the former House of Representative members in Nigeria, just concerning this COP26 in one of his publications recently on English. Uh, he said, Elementary leadership lesson highlights that today's decision shaped tomorrow's future. And that's what we can look at when we're talking about what's going on in the city of Glasgow, Scotland, United Kingdom, concerning COP26. COP26, as we all know, started about a week ago now, roughly more than that now, because they will soon be ending it all. And um, we've seen 35,000 visitors plus um, coming into Glasgow. Different events, different protests, all calling for governments of the world, leaders of businesses, and everyone from the world, every stakeholder there, to come to a decision to agree on steps to be taken to reduce, to achieve the next zero, to achieve this next zero. Um, we're all talking about in the world and also to be able to get that um, you know that 1.5 degree Celsius temperature but the question we need to ask ourselves seriously is is this actually relevant to us and don't get me wrong when I say relevant in terms of relevance what I'm asking is do we have to bring the whole world together to make decisions on this or is it left or is it not supposed to be the responsibilities, the moral responsibilities of the developed nations to actually have agencies or agents across the world go to the local areas where they're having all this disastrous impact of global warming and you know all these climate change issues. Talk to the local people and see how we can help them, how we can make things happen there to help achieve what we're looking for. So far, so good. COP26 is going on. We'll soon be coming to an end. In fact, to show that there's no real progress being made, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom only left Glasgow about roughly an hour ago after giving a speech to appeal to the leaders and all those at COP26 to please come to agreement trying to tell the negotiators to call their leaders to come to agreement. Yet we know that a country like Saudi Arabia, China, are reluctantly, are reluctant about this. Russia, they're not even doing as if they are are interested in it. Then that brings us to the question that, okay, what exactly is this all about? And I've been asking so many questions. You know, I've been asking so many questions of myself, of people I know. And I've seen people actually, you know, telling me, what are you talking about? And the question for me, the first real question for me is, can we realistically achieve net zero? Can we actually achieve it? What happens to economies around the world that depend solely on on things like petroleum, coal, and all these things that put, you know, that, that gives fossil fuel? Some of them, their economy depends on this. Okay. Is COP26 really the place for decisions to be taken concerning this issue? Is it morally right to allow each country, is it not morally right to allow each country and its people to determine how to resolve the climate crisis rather than us deceiving ourselves here in Glasgow? Okay, what are the OPEC member states going to say? What would they do? Already we can see the attitude and the behavior of Saudi Arabia already. From what we're hearing, Saudi Arabia is not coming to the table at all to discuss any agreement. It's one of, the, it's if not the largest, as the largest oil producing nation amongst the OPEC states. Going on, can the world afford the cost of achieving net zero emissions and 1.5 degrees temperature goals? Right. It's something we have to think about. It's something we have to be realistic about. I know, yes, yeah, so many sentiments about this across the world at the moment. In fact, in, our, in my base here in Glasgow, Scotland, we are very, very passionate about it. But some of us who understand international politics and how, how things go deep in other countries, we know this may just be 
a fashion parade sort of thing just to show yourself and come there. If I again look at what Dakuku Peterside said, you know, I love the way he, he classified the countries that will be attending that that, have, that are the COP26. He, he classified them into four. So the first, obviously, would be the Western world, the developed countries of the world, the, the post-industry, the post-industrial economies. These are the ones who are reaching the gospel of net zero emissions and 1.5 degrees um, temp temperature goals. You know, countries like our own here, yeah, the United Kingdom, yes, the developed nations, they are the ones that's the first class. The second group of nations at this COP26 are the ones who are just in Glasgow for showmanship, just to register their presence. When they tell them to come to the table for anything, they are not there, they just want to say, yeah, we are here, call the name of the country, yes, we are here. But in terms of agreeing to anything, none. The third group of country will be those ones whose national economic interests will be imparted by whatever actions are being taken by those post-industrial economies in pursuit of this climate change objective we're looking for. Such countries will be like Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Brazil. All those countries will be there, Angola and co. In fact, India will be there. And then the fourth group, which is the last one, is, uh, these are those countries in pursuit of their national economic interest. They are the ones resisting, you know, resisting the mitigation measures which the Western nations are putting forward and they believe against this harmful effect of climate change. And they are the ones that we may say they are unenthusiastic. They are not really bothered about the, the narrow Western definition of climate change change mitigation and that's where i want to start tonight narrow definition of climate change mitigation and the question you ask yourself is is the west really narrow with this definition of climate change you know are they really narrow about it i mean yes climate change we know it's happening the sea level is going on we're having different you know, natural disasters occurring everywhere when you look at in the last decade till now, so many things happening. I believe, you know, 10 years ago or 11 years ago in Glasgow, there was a lot of snow at this time already, but since 2013 or 2014, we really have snow. We really have a white Christmas in Scotland. And yeah, that tells you something is happening. But the question is, the discussion we are having in Glasgow at the moment, do you really think that will help some people in that flooded area of Bangladesh or in that area of Bakasi? Or what do you think will happen to a country like Australia, whose, you know, whose source of energy is from coal? Or we'll talk about the U.S., coal industry, which has been opened again. These things, you know, we have to face it realistically. Why, yeah, we're talking about Brazil as well, you know, signing, you, you talked about that. The agreement reached last year where they said, oh, they've signed something about deforestation. We have to stop deforestation. Really, how do you want Brazil to survive? Yes, how do you want Brazil to survive? We want to stop deforestation, but some of us still want to buy the best. Some of us still want to buy the best of furniture for the house. Yes, you still have to. You still want to have. You still want to buy a car that would all be like what wood padded inside and things like that. I mean, how do we view it? Let's be realistic about it. It is convenient for the West to say yes, we want to achieve this. We will do this. How many? in a place like Africa can actually afford an electric car, an electric vehicle. If you even talk about, okay, why don't we start cycling? The amount of money that will be needed to bring safe cycling lanes into place in, all of, in places all over the world where this is needed, not to even mention about flying on the plane 
majority of all, the, in fact, if not majority, I think most of those who came to COP26 flew into the country. How then are we reducing this carbon dioxide? Now, one thing I believe we can do and we can really, really do to help the situation is, I think we should allow each country to go back to its people, each leader should go back to its people, to his locality, identify what's happening, let the developed nations look at themselves and think, okay, what do we do? How do we help these people? It's not about sitting down in Glasgow to say we are helping. No, 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 no. I don't think that's the way to go. I think it's more about what are we going to do? I've asked some very keen question earlier. Can the world afford this this whole thing we're talking about, about COP26, you know, this whole issue of net zero emission, 1.5 degrees reduction in temperature. Can we afford it? Because I look at it as, is this another way for the biggest economies in the world to underdevelop and enslave? the less developed countries in the world again. Now, it's an assumption, which I agree can be wrong. It may be wrong, it may be right. But where, how do we know? Look at this. Most of the developed nations, I don't think their source of national revenue or income solely depends on some of these fossil fuel things we're talking about. However, we know some of them have great activities that are affecting, that are causing the troubles. Because most of the companies, most of the multinational companies responsible are from these different developed countries. But I want to pick it like this. Yes, in the UK now we have electric vehicles. Some people are buying it already. By 2030, 2035, yeah, fossil fuel vehicles will be mapped out here completely. We may not have them anymore. Let's go to a place like, you know, some other part of the world, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Mexico, Chile, Bolivia, all those different Caribbean islands, Africa. I said everybody who can afford electric vehicles. And come to think of it, vehicles are not luxuries. They are necessities in the 21st century because people needed to get to work, to take care of their families and everything, to get to places where they are going in time. I don't know how many people can afford that electric vehicles now. Yeah, in the UK, you have access to credit, depending on your, on your credit score and things like that, you may be able to get one on credit and continue to pay for it. But that can be said of every country in the world, which brings us to the, to, to the, you know, to the point that, okay, we have a nation we have nations who survive on petroleum on petroleum solely petroleum you know nothing at all nothing else they do they are reliant on oil and one of those countries is saudi arabia yes we've seen the, you know we've seen the point at which the cost of petroleum went very high and from 2014 it just started coming down and down and down and then you know you you've heard about the Saudi Arabian government talking about Vision 3030, the kingdom will be prepared for a future that is less dependent on falling oil revenue over the next decade and a half. And the question you ask is, that, okay, so what will, what will the kingdom of Saudi Arabia be doing? How, how do they want to pull that off? And when you look at some charts of countries that are dependent on the export of well commodities, which includes natural gas and coal, as well as oil and oil products. Saudi Arabia is ranked 11th amongst those. You know, and, and there are countries where they have more than 90% of their total exports is oil. You can talk about Algeria, Azerbaijan, Brunei Dar es Salaam, Iraq, Kuwait, Libya, Saudi Arabia, um, Sudan, Venezuela. You know, all those countries are there. What would you say about them? You have Nigeria, you have Qatar, you have Kuwait, you have you know Libya, you have um, Oman, Kazakhstan, Russia, um, Iran, Colombia, Norway, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, 
Bolivia, Ecuador, even Ghana, Indonesia, Canada, Malaysia, what will happen to all these countries? You know, and and this, these are countries that depend, you know, they, they do a lot in terms of the export of oil. And this helps their economy. GDP, you know, when you look at the when 45% of the GDP of a nation is depending on oil, what do you want them to do? You if not mention a country like Angola. Angola is there. How do you want all these countries to fare? Even our own UK, yes, we are part of it as well. And the question is begging. You talk about even coal. There are some countries who, you know, they generate the biggest share of their electricity from coal. Botswana, 99.8% of their electricity supply is from coal. Kosovo, Mongolia, 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 I mean to say, South Africa, Moldova, India, Serbia, Poland, Kazakhstan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina, China, Indonesia, all those countries, they depend, they depend solely, you know, they depend on, on this for their, what, for their production. So the question is, yeah, I can, come, I can see some of, some of the listeners saying, yeah, it is, it is best to come together during this crisis. But the question is, yes, we are coming together during this crisis, but what do you want? How do you want, okay, countries I've mentioned there who actually export fuel to help their national revenue. What do you want them to resort to? To start begging for money all over the world? Is this what you want them to resort to? We have so many countries who actually export petroleum products to get their own revenue. We're talking about countries that I've mentioned earlier, Angola, Nigeria, Ghana, Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Kosovo, Russia, China, all these countries, even our own UK. But yeah, UK may have another way of covering this cost. But those countries who are dependent on export of oil for 90% of their revenue, how do you want them to survive? You want them to mortgage the future away by going for loans with the World Bank and IMF? Seriously, let's think about it. Let's actually think about it fairly. Will it not be better for these countries to do it their own way? And in doing it their own way, the developed world, the, 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 you know, the developed world can go into all those different countries and then support projects that will help alleviate the troubles of climate change. That's what I'm saying. Let's just be sincere with ourselves. The fact that we live in Glasgow, in the UK, or in the, way, in the Western country, we may think, well, we can do this, we can do that, the government will do this, the government will stop the use of fossil fuel, fossil fuel cars and everything like that by 2035, 2040, yeah, we're going. But these other countries we are forcing to come along with us. How do we want them to survive? Do we even know what the implication would then be on mobility of labor, which many today will call immigration issue or migrant issue? That's another thing to think about because just imagine it. We allow all of this to fly. We allow it all to fly, you know, yes, yes, everybody, we agree to it, we move forward. And then, all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia, which is, which, which is one of the richest kingdoms in the world, becomes a beggar. And remember, their own country is even a desert. So how do we, how do we actually balance this together? I think, realistically, the developed nations we are, who are preaching this gospel of net zero, rather than calling a party to Glasgow or any other place in the world later on, why don't they just come together themselves, have a strategy of how they go into each of the nations facing problems, and talk with the people in that locality to see how they will, they will be able to help them and then help them. I remember back in Paris, there are different, different promises made, 
communities came to present the issue of their communities till tomorrow. They are still waiting for the promises made in Paris. And then we are about to make another set of promises. Today is Wednesday. They have just between tomorrow, between now and I think noon or Friday to decide. And then we move forward. But seriously, 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 is COP26 actually of relevance to us? Is it just a way by which the world leaders want to just look at how can we clip off their wing and make them come back to us for protection? Because if this is a sincere move, if this is sincere enough, I think the developed countries should start making use of their different embassies to send out diplomats into those countries. What are the climate change problems we have here? Meet the local people. Okay, what are the things that we have to do to help? That way, I believe, we will get somewhere. Rather than deceiving ourselves here, thinking Saudi Arabia will sign up to any agreement. And even if they sign up, do you think they will actually implement it? Or you think Russia and China will sign up an agreement and they will do anything that will be detrimental to the economies and the livelihood of their people? These are the things we have to think about. Yes. And, you know, I always, I always tell my friends who are other activists here in the West that there are differences between our priorities in the West and priorities in other parts of the world because we are not in the same situation. We're not in the same context. The context is different. Yes, the impact of pollution and carbon dioxide in, in, a, in far away Asia can, be devastate, can have devastating effects in Africa and vice versa. But it is still true that it's not the same solution that will apply in every part of the world. Yes, I agree that it's a fact that climate change is having its own effect on communities in every country in different dimensions. We have seen the rising of the sea levels, coastal erosions happening, disrupted economies already. We've seen extreme weather events happening everywhere in the world, food and water scarcity. In fact, insecurity is happening because of the lack of resources. And we have so many conflicts going on. And terrorism is actually part of it. The global challenge is on. It is on. And yes, we need urgent actions to be taken. I wouldn't say action. I would say we need urgent actions. New partnership needs to happen. But this partnership must happen based on the interaction, the result of the interaction we have with the people who are in those locations where all these disastrous events are happening, not with the national government of a nation. No, we have done this in the past. It did not work. Rather, what, what did it lead to? It led to high corruption in different developing countries of the world. Money and mark for different projects from maybe the United Nations or anywhere. It's collected by national governments of countries and they squander it. Nothing to show. Absolutely nothing to show. I don't know if after this COP26, a country like Nigeria or Angola or Russia or China or Saudi Arabia will go about championing 1.5 degrees or even championing the zero emission goals, looking at their national interests at this point in time. What have we put ourselves to at COP26 in Glasgow? It's going to be, well, it is, it is. I think some of you should have, should have said, it's a show of contradictions, how we contradict ourselves in the world. We want to deal with carbon emission and then energy production issues. And sincerely speaking, this is not being, this is not being pessimistic, but this is only being realist, being a realist and being truthful. The COP26 in Glasgow may not arrive at any agreement on these crucial issues and we just need to know that we just need to know that post-industrial nations the western nations the developed nations they've taken their positions suddenly and immediately to shift energy production and usage of carbon to renew renewable energy you know make use of renewable and clean energy which is understandable They've had their own history with carbon energy to fuel and they've moved their industrialization. They've been able to move it 
to knowledge economy, have financial and technological models to champion green, the green energy campaign and the economic opportunities therein. But then we have to look at the new emerging, you know, the new emerging countries of energy. Countries like the UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Nigeria, Ghana, Angola, they have a different position, which is that, you know, giving more time for them to develop as well, they may be able to transit also and be able to have this technology and innovation energy to move from this carbon energy to renewable energy. But not all of a sudden at the same time as the West is moving because we are not developing at the same pace. We are dealing with different issues. And you can even go on to relate that to the political settings. Saudi Arabia is not a democracy. And I don't think their best friend in the West have preached democracy to them at all. But let's leave that aside. The developing nations of the world are heavily dependent. They heavily depend on carbon fuel. They heavily depend on it. Yes, while we see the, the, we see, you know, the developed nations, we say, well, the developing nations are crying to us for help. Yes, it is true, but the help they are crying to you for is not to immediately move us. The president of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari, he promised that, yes, Nigeria would cut its own emissions to net zero by 2060. However, he added something that attaining national and global climate change goals will require adequate and sustained technical and financial support to developing countries. And that developed nations should start giving more effort towards assisting developing nations to meet their nationally determined contributions. And there must be commitment made. And he said they must provide at least a hundred billion dollars yearly on this. That's the position of a country like Nigeria, which will be, we say will be in the third class of the you know four classes that the Kuku Peter side talked about. But when we still come to countries like China and Russia, who are not even bothered about climate change, they are not even bothered about it. So what do we say about that? And these are all these these two nations are leading nations in the world who depend so much on fossil fuel products as well. And this is just a point at which you know I've been saying it all today. And we have to come out clearly. And I will make all this, you know, I will make about three to four things I think developing nations should be putting forward to those leaders in COP26. Yes. And the first thing really is, I think they should say they will have to continue to explore their fossil fuel for consumption and sales to grow their own economies into industrialized economies. Yes, because that's the truth. You can't just tell them to leave what they are doing, what is their mainstay of survival and livelihood and just jump away. No. So I think developing nations should all come together and have that statement that, you know what? Thank you for calling us to COP26 in Glasgow. But first thing is, we need to be given this time to go on to explore our fossil fuel for consumption and for sales to grow our own economies into industrialized levels as well. And they shouldn't allow those big countries to just push them around. No, 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 no. Don't be pushed around to make decisions that will be dangerous to your own, to your own economies, to the survival of your own system and your own people. Because what will happen is that if these developing nations all just agree and move on to this, you know, net zero thing, the truth of the matter is African nations and other developing nations across the world will go into serious economic recession. And that's the truth. Serious economic recession that these developed nations who have told you to do what you've done will not look at you. They won't bleak and lie. So that's the first thing I believe you should do. Secondly, they should demand. This is the developing nation. The developing nations should demand that it will be good to have the new technologies, to have the technical know-how and the economic imperative to make this move being asked of them by the developed nations to achieve this carbon neutrality and zero level, you know, zero emission 
and they should demand that there should be a knowledge transfer between the developed nations and the developing nations. Yes, a knowledge transfer in terms of the green, clean, and renewable energy. That should come as part of the negotiations. As they, I mean, if they are listening to me now, there, this is what the developing nations should be doing and should be putting together. There should be a knowledge and technological transfer of the green, clean, and renewable energy. This should be part of the negotiations. Developed countries must be ready to provide that technical know-how, that technical transfer. No, not no, 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 no. Not what they did then when they were when they were given independence. No, what we're asking for is train guys, train uh, train Saudi Arabians, train Nigerians. Not that when they have issues, they will have to come back to seek your expertise. No, train them. That is what we call transfer, knowledge transfer. Academically, when we're talking about knowledge transfer, is when we share our own experience and skills, knowledge about something with the practitioners. The practitioners share theirs with the academics. And we all we exchange something. That's what we're talking about. There must be that. Developing nations should demand this. It is important. Nobody should go for a double standard because if if you're telling them to move, you can't be telling developing nations to move to carbon free energy whilst hiding the technology from them and then milking Africa. No, that needs to stop. Or other developing nations of the world. You have turned them to, to economies that cannot produce themselves. They can only make things raw materials. They should be given the opportunity now in the 21st century now to be able to produce things, to finish products by themselves and be able to compete in the world economy. So no more take this and then come back for us for how you treat it. No, you have to te teach them everything, how to treat it, how to make it when it has trouble, how to heal it. Yes, so there must be that knowledge transfer. Thirdly, if the developed nations want the, you know, the, the developing worlds of the developing economies to come to put to do away with all their investment into fossil fuels, decades of investment or centuries of investment in the cases of some countries in fossil fuel, then the developed nations must be ready to commensurate them with great incentive, not all these hundred billion pound, hundred billion dollars being asked for by the president of Nigeria. No, 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 no. It's far more than that. You must be able to compensate, serious compensation to all these developing countries you want to pull away from their investment into fossil fuel. Because it means all the, all the different, what, what do we call them, refineries we have around the world, they will all be rendered useless. All the Ajakuta steel or coal everywhere, they will be rendered useless, no more touching them. We have reserves of gas and everything that we can't touch them. So they must be fully compensated. They must be, you know, they must be, there must be continuous increase in the funds made available to these developing nations, not just some, some funds that, okay, yeah, this and that is, no, 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 no. It must be continuous. The more, the more each of these developing nations try to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions, the more they get in commensuration, in, con in incentives. Yes. And finally, I want to end this now. Developing nations must be made to benefit greatly from the economic opportunities that comes with the transition to clean and renewable energy. And that's what I was saying, that it's not as if you move them out and then you, they, you, they have to come back to you. No, these economies, these developing economies should be able to build their own new energy forms. The way they live their lives will change forever because you are taking them away from this fossil fuel they've been used to. Hence, the developed nations must come with the new jobs that will be coming with this, new ideas, new ways of working, new gadgets, new technologies will come up. So they need to make sure the developing nations have everything. They are well positioned also to benefit from this energy mix for their future. 
But before I go, I just say this. To Nigeria in particular, and all other developing nations, your leaders at COP26, they need to adequately express the national interest and the model of operation as the modus operandi in engaging with the rest of the world about this renewable energy, climate change, and the economic impl implications for them. You have to come out clean. You have to stand by your own people and you have to let the developed and those rich nations know the consequences of what they are calling for on your people, the implications and what you stand for. I believe I've been able to open some people's eyes to this. Next week, we may have one of the delegates who, was, who, who has attended this COP26 next week on the show to ask sincere questions. But until next week, I remain yours only, Lion Olusha Kumbi. And today, I have been able to show you the relevance or irrelevance of COP26 to us. Thank you, and God bless.